Hello. Welcome to our Music Makers Hack Lab day here at the Discourse Program in Bethanien. Next to me is Peter Kern and Moritz Simon Geist. So just wanted to quickly say the Hack Lab, as you probably know, is this kind of collaborative, improvisatory, interdisciplinary artistic laboratory that we do at the festival since five years now together with Peter Kern and each year with a co-host. This year this is the artist and computer scientist Johan Maria. And uh, the Hack Lab just started yesterday at the How Hebel am Ufer. They're working there every day. Each year we do an open call. Artists, technologists, programmers and so on, they apply with their ideas. Then there's a selection being made. They are invited as fellows into the Hack Lab. Then they group up into teams and work on projects over the next week. And then on Sunday, the fourth in the afternoon at five, they will present what they have worked on in this week in short performances at the How Hebel am Ufer. So it's always recommended to go there. And it also has become a tradition that we invite other artists, researchers, theorists to give inputs into the Hack Lab and this is what we do today. And uh, Peter Kern will then briefly introduce the theme this year, the Hacked Mind. It's part of a wider focus on artificial intelligence in music that we do this year in the festival and that is uh, thankfully funded by the German Federal Cultural Foundation. And I also want to thank our long-term partner for the Hack Lab, Native Instruments, who support the Hack Lab since many years, and also the Shape Network, uh, a festival network that is co-funded by the program uh, Creative Europe of the European Union. And they also support the Hack Lab this year. Okay, so Peter Kern, he runs the website Create Digital Music and also Create Digital Media and he's a musician, an artist, a developer. He also uh, has this project MeBleep, which is a uh, sound making devices, so to say. Yeah, and uh, now he's gonna give a short intro on the theme. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, yeah. Simon. Thanks so much, Jan, and yeah, thanks to all of our partners. And um, some of our Hack Lab people are here today to kind of get some inputs and other inspiration. So the, the crux of what the Hack Lab is about is sort of the art of not knowing what's going to happen. You know, it's, it's Tuesday. Right now, uh, the participants who aren't here to kind of absorb some inspiration are over in the studio of Houtzfei working away in teams to create something and they don't yet know exactly what those things will be or what those performances will be. When the lights go up uh, Sunday evening at five, we don't know exactly what's going to happen and that's sort of the joy of it. And that applies as well to the theme. So what we wanted to um, uh, trigger with the theme of the hacked mind was some investigations both into what the essence of these machines and algorithms might be, and then also some reflection on, on what that means about our own selves and our own agency. So we left it purposely open. Um, we were not, in fact, so that you could, looking at the schedule, you could believe that downstairs the agenda is to increase the participation of women in the music industry, and upstairs our agenda is to decrease the participation of humans, but that's not, that's not exactly the idea. Um, we, it's, it's really the, an opportunity for artists to come together and uh, explore potential futures and explore themselves. So already we've had everything from people who have a really deep expertise in applying certain algorithms and research and machine learning to people working with meditation and ways of changing our own human consciousness and all those things are getting melded together. So the bots should be teaching us something about what it means to be human and um, the humans will be exploring themselves through what they get back from the code and the algorithms. And uh, all of that will happen on Sunday. But in the meantime, uh, Moritz, it's great to have Moritz here because he was uh, five years ago, for, we've, this is the sixth year we've done the Hack Lab and Moritz was part of the, our very first program. That's right. Bring is between this kind of difference between robots and real, you had a, a, a big machine that was both more real than the 808 in that it had acoustic <laughs> instruments and more machine than, than the normal 808 in that it was played by robots. That's right. Uh, it was here with the big 808 drum robot. 
Yeah. Exactly. So um, now I'll stop talking and, and uh, get the pleasure of listening to what these folks have us to say about our theme. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks a lot for coming here. Thanks for the introductions, uh, Jan and Peter. And uh, I will start the presentation once uh, it's switched to my laptop. Sorry. Okay. Wonderful. Okay, so my talk is called Art Fiction, the Speculative Future of Art, Music and Technology. And um, I will just give you a short overview about what I gathered in the last years um, in this field, talk, um, thinking about futurism, about speculative design, and especially about machine learning and music and um, body enhancement and drugs and where this can lead us, what are possible outcomes of this, and um, what, yeah, what my ideas about this are. So um, just a sh short word about myself. Um, uh, I'm Moritz, and I'm also uh, under the name Sonic Robots Making Music. And um, as Peter already mentioned, I had an installation here five years ago, um, it's called MR808, it's a big drum robot. Um, so basically, I'm artistically mo mostly in the field of robotics and music and um, trying to make physical sounds and um, try to make um, electronic music without electronics. So um, apart from this kind of retrospective um, design piece MR808, which I did. I also do other installations, for example, um, my last one, Tripods One, um, which tried, tries to look a little more into the future of how um, electronic music can be created. And in this whole scope of, of thinking about music, thinking about the future, I, um, I often come about this whole topic, futurism. So, of course, I'm not the only one um, thinking about this, by far not. And um, there's a whole field of science dedicated to this um, whole, uh, yeah, to this whole topic. And um, one thing you often stumble upon is this sketch. So, um, basically, if you think about the different futures, like in the plural uh, sense of way, you normally would say, okay, we have the now and the future itself is not determined. So you can have different outcomes of how things can be. And um, one thing you can do is like make a future cone. So to depict all the different ways some kind of technology or some idea can develop. And so um, you would mostly start off with a really broad view, like the possible future. This means that you can, um, you can, you can imagine things that um, that don't have a background in the technology, uh, technology which um, is known right now. One example, for uh, instance, is um, the warp drive from Star Wars. You may be knowing this because, um, uh, because the warp drive, you can imagine that something like this exists, but it doesn't rely on technology that we know right now. So this is kind of the, or the possible future that exists. Then you have the plausible futures. Uh, the plausible futures is something where you can say, okay, we have technology which we know right now, and we can also imagine what um, this could be in the future when we blow it up really, when it's in, on, on, uh, when, when it's re like really blown up, like machine learning, um, what can be done with machine learning when uh, it's really like on, um, on endorphins. So, um <clears throat> and then we have the probable future. The probable future is something Mm, for example, if you take the climate change, if you would just um, uh, release all the carb carbon uh, dioxide as we do now, the probable future is that we end up something at five degrees earth warming. And, um, and so the probable future of this is um, that all life will be extinct at some point. The plausible future, though, is that we can create something around it uh, where we don't waste our um, Earth so badly. So this is also an overlapping thing called preferable future. Okay, I will not go into detail here. There's a lot of people um, talking about this. Um, uh, for example, the Extrapolation Factory, um, a big research group in the States. So what I'm interested in is like the speculative possible futures. And I will start with one field, um, which uh, a lot of people are talking about, uh, which is machine learning, also called artificial intelligence, also called neural networks. It's some, something blurry uh, often or mixed up. <clears throat> and um, I, was, I was thinking, okay, what, what, what is the connection between uh, machine learning and music? 
and not pretty in terms of what is possible right now. So uh, if we take all this, all this, all this um, uh, uh, technologies that we have right now already and uh, try to rethink what could be a possible future in several decades uh, with machine learning, what, what could be possible. I will start off um, with like a very basic uh, thing. I mean, uh, I don't know how, the, uh, um, how much you know about it, but like this is a very, um, very basic uh, neural network um, which does something called style transfer. So basically you take a, you take a model, you train it, uh, in the middle with a picture of Miro here, and then you take an input, um, this guy, and it kind of, um, it kind of repaints this uh, man in the style of the uh, neural network as you trained it. So this is a very um, simple thing. So um, in the last, um, yeah, in the latest time, um, it, um, it, got little, it got really weird, this uh, whole thing. For example, um, stuff like this happens. It's without volume. So um, this is an um, app which was released, um, which was released, um, I think, a few weeks ago. It uses uh, neural networks to um, to take an input of um, of, uh, of faces and um, replace faces in videos with like the um, object it was trained to. It's mostly used in porn um, to basically put celebrities on, uh, the, um, on the faces of the porn actors. Um, it's also called Deep Fake, I think. Fake app, Deep Fake it's called. So, um, so as you can see, like this whole thing is really developing quite fast. So um, thinking about machine learning and music, there's al already um, some a lot of people doing this, but mostly in composition, um, as Google, for example, or also in sound-wise, and I want to show you some examples. Um, what you normally do is, um, when you look at the raw uh, sound files, you normally work in layers. So um, you, uh, you take like the raw audio data, and if you want to analyze it, and you want to, to get out like the musical structure out of like an MP3 file, for example, then you would um, just like go layer by layer and analyze this um, this wave file. I will not go in deta into detail here, but um, you start off with like some raw data, and you end with basically, or you can end with the melodic or the harmonic or the rhythmic or the overall musical context which this um, raw audio data represents. So there's already a um, few companies doing this. Um, one is called Synaptic from Hanover. They have pretty amazing products, and um, two of them are called Unfilter and Pitch Map. And um, I also want to show you a video. So wh what we just heard, sorry, what we just heard was they take, they take um, audio material and they guess, they guess what what uh, lacks. So um, you had like an audio material with like a, um, like a filter on it, and they were guessing with neural networks what was missing. This is amazing. I will play it to you again. Of course, it's maybe somewhere hidden, but like to, to have all this detail and all this, uh, like all the things that are missing, this is really crazy. I, w I was trying it out myself, and it's really crazy. So I was coming up with my first speculative product. Um, think you, um, you, uh, think you, you don't want to, you, you want to go really deep inside, inside the musical material. So let's say you take the style transfer and um, you apply it to music. You separate the voice from, um, from the playback and you come up with something uh, like with this imaginary product con called Unstyle plugin. So it, what it basically does, it changes the playback accordingly to a train set. As, you, as I showed you before in the, um, uh, for graphics, you can do it um, for, for pictures pretty well also right now. And like for audio, we are, we are like decades away from this. But um, if this would happen, it would probably be a little like this.
So this is actually this is actually um, um, a showcase of of a real um, of a real program which um, which depicts uh, uh, which shows how um, how you can uh, analyze material um, music material and make and apply to other um, genres. What they did there. Um, was that they actually played it again with synthesizers and stuff. So um, the, um, I cannot actually go back to the video at the point where they showed. Um, but um, what they did, they analyzed material and um, they trained their neural networks to um, make it appear as, it did, as if it was in another style. Like uh, the original, of course, you know, it was a classical piece. Um, then they had it like in Beatles style and everything. So um, if you have this, oops. If you have this, you will probably come up with an um, app which can, um, which can change the musical background according to your trained app. What would that be? I mean, it sounds a little like a crazy idea, but what would be the actual impact for, um, for, for musical um, artists or for the industry? So basically that means that you can take super crappy software or you can take super crappy artists which play the music and you can apply your neural network, your trained neural network which you trained with like a million dollar production um, uh, input and you can basically sketch out the song um, as you only did it like in a very crappy way. This actually exists for, uh, for, for graphics already. If you, there's like an app where you can just like uh, draw like a sketch and, and, and then refigures out like the whole, um, the whole idea. Um, you can sketch out and let I, AI do the rest. You can concentrate, of course, on the pro side. You could concentrate on the musical content rather than on the sound a lot because like as a musician, uh, you don't have to care for, 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 for sound so much anymore. Monetization-wise, uh, artists can appear in many different genres. Um, like a song can be, can be a really liquid thing which changes over genres. It changes when you're jogging. It changes while you hear it, uh, like when cleaning up or whatever. And uh, you don't have to pay for remixes as well. On the disadvantage side, every artist can at least sound like every other artist because if you have the training set, if, if you play the training set and if you have like a like a crazy auto-tune thing which changes your voice according to another voice. I mean, this applies mostly for pop music so far, um, but uh, in this scope. Um, then I can actually sound like every other artist as well. Um, if you throw in AI composition, like uh, making the compositions also, um, uh, also um, uh, enhanced with, uh, with um, artificial intelligence, you can ha have even more quality. But in the end, um, it leads to um, the artistic value being dissolved. And um, my guess is in the future, music will be so from of so high quality that music will be not be conceived as an art, art form anymore. Um, if you disagree, talk to me later. <coughs> okay, so um, this brings me to my, uh, to my next topic. So, I <coughs> sorry, I don't know if you know this guy. Uh, which of you does know this guy? One or two, okay. So, Alexander Shulgin, uh, he, is, um, he looks like a mad professor and he's not, not, I mean, he's partly. But he, um, he's one of the, I, I'd say he's one of the biggest names in drug research, in non-governmental drug research. Um, and one of the, his biggest uh, hits was like uh, reinventing or refiguring out how MDMA is, um, uh, is made. So um, he was basically a an, an scientist living in the US. Um, he died about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I don't know. And um, he invented a lot of drugs, really specific um, scientific things to, um, to, to, to change the body, to change different um, aspects of the body. And uh, reading um, through his um, oeuvre, I found one drug that he did, it call, it's called DIPT, uh, 4-hydroxy-NN, okay, whatever, I'm not a um, um, chemist. But this drug does nothing but change 
the way you perceive um, uh, you perceive the tone pitch. So if you take it, you hear everything one octave higher or lower. And I found this so amazing because like, it ha has a very specific, very narrow band and in, 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 in doing things. And I figured out, like, man, we, we really have been uh, mingling with all these digital things right now, like all the electronics. We are like, so advanced right now, like these phones and stuff. I just got me a new phone. It's just crazy. Um, but like, biologically-wise, we are I mean, we, we know how to ha uh, cure a lot of stuff, like health things is, is a thing, but like enhancement, there hasn't been done so much research, not uh, compared to as electronics. So this is my main guess. I mean, also, I'm not alone here. Uh, this is my main guess uh, what, uh, what the next thing will be. And I will present you my be famous pill. Okay, so what does this do? The celebrity voice acting be famous pill. So basically, um, you have this pill, you take it, and it changes the, the way your vocal cords um, correspond to the pitch of your voice and the way your um, like voice is created. So basically, um, you can take one and you can speak for 15 minutes in the way of an actor, of an actress. Um, so you have it here, first review on YouTube. And um, my guess is the past was digital, the future will be biological, and there will be no music, but that's another thing. So. Um, you can check it out. I have some products here. They're pretty expensive. And um, <coughs> the thing is, what would happen if this, uh, um, uh, if this would be reality? Um, of course, I didn't come unequipped. So um, let's say you have, um, you all know, like RS scan and uh, fingerprint, uh, unlock your phone and stuff. And so there's also like voice ID, okay? So uh, you basically talk some few sentences into your phone and then uh, blob, it unlocks your phone, it unlocks your Twitter or, or Instagram or whatever. So now you can already uh, guess it. Um, what would happen if like I take this pill and of a celebrity and I try to log into one of their in, uh, into one of their accounts. So this stuff is unavoidable. Um, there will be hacking, tons of hackings with like these kinds of devices. And um, yeah, thanks for listening. Yeah, you, you can have it. Can you show us what happens when you take the mic? Switch down, but not. Yeah, we want to see a demonstration of the Be Famous pill. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, I <laughs> yes. Oh, and I see. Yeah, it's a speculative right. product, so um, no medical um, uh, test, test has been done. I haven't, don't have any apes. Yeah. So far, they were all uh, trashed by Volkswagen. Animal so, uh, testing will go very so differently with this product. <laughs> um, yeah, any questions? from our audience. But I need to They're still just working on all of those ideas. And, and yeah? We have a mic coming to you. Thanks. Of course, I, I'm going to ask, like, why do you think the future, uh, in the future, the music will not be considered as art? I think, like, you should just, like, be more concrete, maybe, like, the music which is produced by AI, it's not considered as art because it's that such high, but I think the people will still produce the music because for me, music is emotions. And only if we run out of the emotions, then we stop to make music. My personal take on AI, it's more like, I, I wish everybody becomes a musician for his own, you know, like the, the apps and uh, all these, all these ad, um, advantages on the technology could actually help everybody to get into the creative mood and uh, like think about his own emotions or even like not only emotions but everything what can, what can uh, like um, put into the music. So I'm um, on the opposite, you know, it's maybe therapeutical for the future for everybody. So everybody can uh, deal with uh, their own emotions internally but also externally through these applications. So in the future, maybe music as so, it's not considered art, but uh, it might become something else. So what do you think where it will go, where it will end? 
Yeah, I totally agree with you. I mean, okay, <laughs> you don't <laughs> have to couldn't have said it better. But uh, yeah, this is this is definitely right. I mean, what what I meant when when I said like I, I shortened it up to make it like Twitterable, you know, but like uh, uh, like this this um, this combination of an artist being on the stage or being like in the spotlight and uh, all the audience being uh, listening and this relationship basically can end. I mean, this is only one possible future of how it can be but um, this is something like if, if all that happens what you said like um, everybody being an artist and so this relationship will be definitely damaged also in a positive way maybe well right and so it seems like the way that you're describing it would damage the sort of I don't know it's either really bad or really good for cover bands right <laughs> um, it seems to damage this pro part of musical transmission that involves mimicry and that the machine can do the mimicry um, and maybe a lot of our technology was pushing, like showing GarageBand, maybe a lot of our technology was pushing toward selling people on the idea of mimicking a particular style, instrumentation, whatever. Um, is there still some space for kind of or original music creation or can we even define what original music creation is if it's... Um, <laughs> yeah. Easy question. Just to make a short question. <laughs> yeah, I mean this is definitely, but it's not only a con a lot. It's not only specific to to art. I mean this is specific to a lot of things when you involved with when you are involved with AI. I mean what if you in the end have like a system which which creates something, be it like an autonomous car which learns to drive in in the surrounding where it's like implemented, like in, in be it in India or in Sweden. Um, I mean how can you or, or be it like art. Um, how can you say which is what is uh, what is uh, um, um, unique anymore? Like uh, it's a big question, but it's more like a philosoph philosophical question, I guess. Well, what's the relationship between at least what you're describing with what's going on with machine learning techniques, and what you're describing with sort of modifying um, human consciousness? So the hack lab participants are already kind of pushing against this question, not necessarily mm -hmm. by taking drugs in the hack lab, but by like <laughs> doing meditation and things which can even be more powerful. Um, is there some kind of analog between those two trends, but sort of the kind of this externalization of human consciousness and then this idea of modifying human consciousness? Yeah, I mean, this wasn't w wasn't really part of my uh, of my of the product I was thinking of, but I mean, there's definitely a, uh, there's, there's definitely a, like a combination because as you said, if you can externalize like the uh, emotions, for example, a lot of people, they are listening to music because they want to kind of change their emotional state of, uh, status in, in a kind of way. And if you have like an exchange, I don't know if this leads to where your question was aiming, but if you have like an exchange here and you can, for example, have a liquid music which listens to like your emotions and like adapts the, the, um, like the musical material, like really, really, uh, really liquid, I mean, this can be, it can be awesome. It can be also, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I, don't, I, I would think it's awesome. Hmm. Yeah. I, I, just recently I read uh, in, a, in a book about um, like um, neuroimaging of your brain uh, when uh, listening to the music. So for example, there is like in, in the frontal globe, there is um, this um, evaluation center or kind of like, um, uh, how, how to call that? Uh, if you do something uh, right, it will give you the dopamine kind of, you know, mm. dose. So it's um, the, the region of the brain is uh, bonding kind of. Uh, it's also uh, for the, like it's active when you are taking drugs, so for the drug abuse. But they also realize that the music also activates this part of the of the brain. So I think like maybe the AI could be helpful once you, as you say, like if you really have some psychical issue or some, some trauma or some, let's say really like a, a mental issue, the AI can uh, prescribe you the right music to actually filter your emotion or the psychical, uh, psychical state. That's, you know, like, um, is there any research like uh, in, on, on this? Like, Recently, do, do you know? I, I, I mean, I wouldn't overestimate the, the I mean, p music definitely has power and I'm a musician as well. So for me, it's, it's, it's definitely has p some power. But like if you if you're talking about uh, if you're talking about like real drugs, uh, real uh, mental things, I, I wouldn't maybe I mean, it's, I think it's more subtle. What do you think? Well, there's also sort of the peculiarity of people having different responses to music, right? So this has been the problem with doing even something as simple as color association. If you hear C is blue, 
and someone else here's C is E, what, what you're describing becomes even, even more severe, right? So some people may actually go to Barakhan on a Sunday afternoon and that calms them down to other people that would be, would freak them out, you know? Some people will, like are in kind of a depressed emotional state and need to listen to Cradle of Filth and someone else needs to listen to Bach. Um, it would be, I wonder how you would structure research on, on that. <laughs> yeah. um, but there's another question back here. Hold that thought, though, because I know Jean gets to some of these issues, too. Yeah? Yeah, just to comment on the previous thought, I think it's really interesting how algorithms conflate our preferences with what we actually want. Um, like, you know, when, I listen, when I'm in a bad mood and I, I click like on a couple of songs with minor keys, and then I get just constant songs with minor keys, and my mood goes down and down and down, <laughs> and what, how is this helping? <laughs> um, but I also was thinking, um, you said like the present is digital the, for drugs, the present is digital, the future is biological. Um, it occurs to me that uh, you can get drug effects from digital like uh, experiences in virtual reality and stuff like that can really give you a, a transportative sensation. Um, is it, have you done any reading or have you come across any creation of explicitly digital drugs that uh, that don't affect your chemicals? Um, not really. I mean, there's, there's a lot of research, for example, about um, VR sickness, it's called. It's, it's, it's more like on the bad side of what you don't want to happen when you, when you wear, wear like uh, VR glasses, um, because people, are, I mean, this, like, this virtual rea reality um, techniques, they um, tend to mess up with your internal balancing system, and so you get sick. It's like seasick. So uh, this is kind of uh, like a bad thing that you don't want to happen, but it's definitely an interference between the two worlds. Um, on the other hand, I have to say all this digital thing, I, I made this like, uh, I made it into two points because I think all the digital world and everything, it, it's, not, um, it's not inside our body. It's like, it's just using the senses that we had like for, for thousands, ten thousands of years. And it's just like playing with the senses. I mean, it's playing pretty well with our senses right now, but like to, to have like a really precise effect, as I, as I showed you, this drug was really overwhelming. Um, uh, if we have like a precise, um, um, the, in, um, uh, pr precise function in our brain, which we can trigger with like a drug that is uh, very, really well designed, this is something different than when you have like only external um, external things coming to your senses. I saw a question you. next yeah. next to you. Yeah, I think there was a there was a, a question next to you as well. Maybe not anymore. The, it's answered now. In the back. Uh, and how is your, your feeling regarding authorship when using uh, artificial intelligence? For instance, if I, compo if I use uh, artificial intelligence to compose the music, or if I, even if I not even compose it at all, I just uh, give some tasks to the, to the machine and, and it composes the music. How, how is this being seen somehow? Like, uh, is there an authorship? Is, if I am the, the coder, the person who writes the code, I, I become the author for this, how, how this is being uh, treated? It goes in the direction of what you were, uh, of you were asking, I think. Like the authorship, um, I mean, from the state of like, uh, in, the uh, in the community, um, I think the authorship right now would be like the coder um, which, uh, which codes. I mean, the, qu the question is to sum it up, like who, uh, if I have like a, um, if I have a, like a program which creates a, composition, who's the author, basically, yeah? Is it like the AI, is it like the one who g gave the input for this? I mean, like, if I train a set to Bach and it creates a lot of Bach uh, things, is like the, uh, the coder the author or like, um, like, a, like a third figure or Bach, who, who is it? Um, but I think right now um, the community would consider the coder to be like kind of the author of this. Um, though um, there's like a very uh, interesting thing going on for uh, self-driving cars. I will just mention it um, very, very broad, uh, quickly here because um, we don't have so much time. But there's a question like if a self-driving car um, uh, makes an accident, who is responsible for this? So um, there's the idea, okay, one, it's like the car builder or the coder, um, or there's like the idea um, it's, it's kind of a between law and philoso philosophy a question, like maybe uh, we have to create an entity on its own. 
um, which which would say, okay, the car has like a has like an owned identity, which can also be punished for like creating this accident. This might sound pretty weird, um, but um, you have it in like German law. Um, for example, you have the GmbH, which is also like a kind of um, intellectual construct without any bodily um, uh, structure, which can, uh, which can like punished or go in front of the court. So I think um, this question, like for music, it's, uh, it's interesting for this author, uh, um, author thing, but like for self-driving cars, for example, it will um, quickly be in a, in a, in a uh, very, like in a very um, different uh, way, yeah. I'll take one more question while to give Jean a chance to get ready, I think, yeah. Hello, hello. It's, it's more of a thought, less than a question. I was just wondering, because to generate music using AI, you need a lot of data set. You need a decent big data set. So to train a model, you need at least like a couple, a couple hundred songs. And I was wondering if that would affect the creative process in itself, if that we as artists would tend to create songs that are untrainable, for example, or change our patterns more frequently to trick AI, so not to be copied, for example. So each track will be very different from others. So we don't, the, the machine can track a pattern, therefore it can be reproducible by, by, a, by a model, for example. So I was just wondering the relationship between AI changing the creative process and forcing us to take different paths and to change our own uh, patterns and signatures in our own creative process. It's just a thought. Yeah. I, I didn't get the so question I guess right. The, the, the question, if I understand it, is what can the role of these uh, algorithms be in in transforming our own behavior, if I heard that correct. Yes, mostly because to to reproduce the tracks, you need a lot of uh, you need a large data set to reproduce a style, right, a genre. So you need a you need to train the model. For example, to recreate a bot, you need to insert at least like maybe a fifty or hundred MIDI MIDI sequences to train the model how to create a proper bot. And I was wondering if we as artists would change the way we make music to change our tracks or to oh. force ourselves to create different styles from, for example, one record to the other. So we, so we are perceived, our, our creative output is perceived as more, more original because it's different. It's, it's different than a style, than a genre, for example, than techno, that it has a lot of similarities between tracks. So I guess, yeah, the, so the question is, will, will, um, will all of this mean musicians start to try to behave in a way that makes them different from the AI. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, of course. <laughs> I'd, say, I'd say, sure, you, you will fi find as an artist uh, using like a, like a tool which everybody else also uses, you will try to fa make the difference. Um, but in my, if, if you're like in, in one genre, uh, maybe like the differences on what the outcome is might be not so big if you throw in like another uh, data set of like your neighbor, which is like uh, throwing in like a slightly different uh, um, data set. But in the end, I mean, like uh, the AI, it's not like you, you throw in one data set and you let it work and then it gets, generates one output and you do it like again a second time and, and we create like the, exact di uh, like the exact same output as well. So, um, so it could make also like not so much difference and um, I don't know what uh, artists will come up with like to distinguish themselves from each other. Uh, I saw one last question in the, yeah, sure, in the center. And I'll go ahead and let Jean kind of sneak up here, I guess, with his laptop. Um, you made a distinction between musical material and sound, but there's music in which uh, melody and harmony aren't key elements. So how would those um, applications deal with that kind of music? Uh, I, didn't, I didn't, didn't get one word, and that was the important word. They are what? Um, well... So you, you made a distinction between musical ma material and yeah. sound, and there's music in which um, harmony and melody, or also vocals, aren't the key elements. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I mean, this is like um, this is um, yeah. This, this is right, of course. But like, if you would like go from a like technical view, you would start with like these two distinctions. Like, look at the tempo. Look at the look at the like the main uh, choreography of the song. Look at the um, the tonal things. Look at the rhythms and stuff. And then you would look at the um, at the kind of sound of it. Um, being more like uh, which frequencies are there, if you can like take apart different instruments, how are these uh, instruments shaped and stuff. And like um, voices, for example, would be only one part of 
of each, of course, because like a voice would be uh, at the one point like an instrument which has like a like a sound, and on the other hand, it would be also connected to the to the musical structure, um, be, uh, having been played uh, like a melody and so on. And if you um, and how you combine these together, this is actually up to the per person who like creates the creates the um, machine learning system. It strikes me that we, we may have reached another conclusion with today's presentation, which is that the music stuff is not the useful application of this, and it will just make really, really good hearing aids. <laughs> um, but thank you so much, Moritz, for, for, uh, for talking to us. And um, I think we'll, we'll get on to uh, next to Gene Kogan, who's going to pick up some of those same, same ideas. So thank you, Moritz. Thank you. Thank you. That was Da -da. We're, I was going to say that was a terrible. Switched. Can you switch? Oops. Or did we lose? Okay, there we go. <laughs> Um, Gene came and talked to us yesterday in the Hack Lab, so we've been uh, uh, working with him and, and, and seeing how he works in, in that context. Um, I think after this last presentation, if, if you're concerned that some of this sounds dystopian or, or not like a future that you necessarily want to pursue, that was sort of part of the question that we all wanted to ask. And so anybody who saw my colleague, uh, Johan Maria, uh, and her performance on Friday, set the tone early that we weren't necessarily being entirely optimistic about the future of technology, to say the least. She sort of presented a terrifying dyst set of dystopias on the stage. So part of what we want to do with this um, program is to ask, to be unafraid to ask those questions. We're not here to promote technology necessarily, but to um, inquire about what it means and, and what the different facets of the cone of the future that Moritz presented might look like. Um, so Gene, I actually saw your work, I think, for the first time in New York. I realized you did a presentation at the Music Hack Day, I think, in 2011. So that was a, so there was a time that we crossed paths in New York. Um, but uh, Gene has been doing all kinds of research and art coming from a, from a, a background and uh, uh, outside, strictly speaking, the machine learning realm, but, but um, um, becoming really an a inspiring practitioner of showing us lots of different possibilities of what this technology can do. So uh, you, you may have seen his presentation at Ableton Loop for people who are out there. Um, we got another taste of that yesterday in the Hack Lab as he showed us some of the available tools that our participants are a, uh, might or might not use and um, some of the, the applications of them. But today, I think we're going to get um, a different angle um, as we sort of continue this afternoon's investigations into different possible future scenarios. So, if you're ready, now here's Gene. Thanks a lot. Hello. <laughs> Thank you. You guys can hear me? Everyone? Okay, I just put this on. All right, so, yeah, thanks for having me. And, and actually, I just changed the title of this talk yesterday to Music Makers Dystopia, and I... Well, that's not actually what you should be seeing. Is that up? All good? Take time out. Hang on. Well, I'll just talk. It's just a title screen. So the, um, OK, yeah. The title is called Music Makers Dystopia. This is probably going to be the most depressing talk of the whole conference. So I'm just warning you in advance. Um, and I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk a lot about machine learning, um, which is mo most of what I do, and, and kind of talk about how it fits into the mus musical process. Most people have been seeing a lot of like, you know, really impressive work with machine learning in the visual domain, and audio is beginning to catch up. Um, and that's kind of like, I'm going to try to hint at a, a, future, a future kind of depressing scenario. So, uh, but I'm going to start in the past. Um, how many people recognize this? This is the RCA Mark II synthesizer. And it was the world's first electronic musical music synthesizer um, ever built, I think 1957. 
and it's still standing today in uh, Prentice Hall at Columbia University. Peter, I know you know these guys, right? Yeah, good friends. Um, so this is where I went to college, and I first encountered electronic music and computer music and machine learning. And these things were kind of like very much intertwined in this uh, very, very special place in New York uh, where they're keeping you know, the world's oldest synthesizer. And actually, you can still play it to this day. You can, they take it out once in a while, and all the buttons are really dusty. And, uh, but it, it still makes sound, kind of. Um, but in any case, um, this is where I discovered first the field of music information retrieval, which was my start in machine learning and in music technology. And music information retrieval is this field that is, um, basically concerns itself with the um, obtaining of interesting information from audio so that you can do interesting things with it. So, for example, um, detecting automatically what the genre of a piece of music is or what the emotional or mood characteristics of it are um, or assigning tag words to audio directly from the audio signal. And this can be very useful for playlisting and for music recommendation. And that was kind of, for me, always uh, the thing that I was most interested in, music recommendation. And that's something I'm going to come back to at the end of this talk, um, the whole curation aspect. Um, I was always, you know, as big as I'm sure almost everybody here is, big new music fan, always trying to, you know, find whatever the newest music that's going to appeal to me uh, would be. And I was always trying to figure out, like, is there some way to automate this? And so instead of having to listen to so much stuff that I end up not liking, can I actually, like, can I predict this ahead of time? And that's going to be, that's, that turns out to be a very elusive goal. But we'll see that we're actually um, possibly headed in the right track. Um, now, in the... Um, in this landscape of people who are interested in music technology and doing music information retrieval, there's a really big um, cohort of people who are particularly interested in, in production of music. So making musical instruments, making synthesizers, uh, making interactive programs that play music. And I was really fortunate to, to befriend uh, someone named Jeff Snyder, who is now the the director of the Princeton Laptop Orchestra. So maybe if you've seen like a bunch of crazy people in laptops making music, um, that's that's been kind of inspired by this. This is the first laptop orchestra um, that there was, and he's and, and Jeff is a builder of musical instruments. And these are these are not actually this doesn't make any sound. It's just a controller, and it has a whole bunch of capacitive touch sensors. And um, b but what you could do with it is, well, you can do anything, right? It's a controller. And the idea is that we uh, try to build interfaces that let a musician program the instrument to play in a certain way. So for example, uh, and this is another instrument that he built called the Burl, which is an electronic, something like an electronic flute or an electronic wind instrument. And the idea is that a musician can, can grab the instrument, put their fingers on the touch sensors, and then there's a, also a breath pressure and embouchure sensor, which senses the position and shape of the mouth. And all of this sensor, sensor data, the musician can associate a particular, set of sens uh, a particular set of inputs that they give the instrument with some sound that uh, a synthesizer is going to make. So let me, let me just show you like um, a per one person playing it. This is Pedro Eustache, who's a like, professional flautist, learning how to play the burl. So, and, and, uh, okay, so the, the, the neat thing about the, um, this paradigm of making music is that you, um, you know, normally, like, if you've ever learned a musical instrument, you know it's really hard to kind of physically learn how to, how to you know, work with the instrument, right? And that can be a big barrier to being creative with, with an instrument, right? So, like, every time I've ever tried to play a flute, I can't even, like, e I can't make any sound come out, right? So I really appreciate, like, for those of you who have taken the time to learn how to play some of these instruments, uh, it takes a lot of practice, right? 
but, but maybe this is kind of suboptimal, that you require people who might otherwise be very creative to actually have to learn an instrument. And what this does is it re totally reverses it. So then the, musician, the, the instrument itself has no fixed way of making sound. The musician trains the instrument to make sound in the way that they desire. And then uh, from there, they can begin playing it almost automatically. So what you saw with Pager Ustash, that was within a few minutes of training the interface. So there's a really quick um, sort of a, a quick turnaround time between training and, and then being expressive, being creative with the instrument. Um, now, obviously, like electronic music has a really, really long history and, and a, and a le long legacy. And you know, it's kind of why we're all here for this festival. And um, in the early days, right, so that you're looking at, so this is um, Stockhausen, Daphne Oram. This is actually Pauline Oliveros on the Buchle. I think not, not the same one that I showed earlier, but, but uh, very similar. <clears throat> um, in the early days, electronic music synthesis was, was pretty simple. You know, we were just ex experimenting with simple oscillators and modulators and, and, um, and then also music concrete, which is, you know, people experimenting with tape. Um, but then in the 90s, something changed, which is that computers became fast enough and um, you know, complex enough that we could actually try to encode algorithms which would, which would actually um, give you every sample of music. So audio, digital audio is usually 44,000 samples per second. So if a computer needs to produce that much, that much data every second, it can be very difficult, right? But in the 90s, they began to be able to do that fast enough that you could generate music live. And um, so people began to explore physical models as a way of approximating sounds in nature. So like when, for example, if you ever hear a digital uh, like guitar string being plucked, that's just an algorithm which is simulating, what's it called, car plus strong, which is like a string uh, vibration model. And there's all sorts of these online. And they, they really actually went through a big, big, um, kind of a big golden age in the 90s. And, and the quality of our synthesizers began to, began to improve a lot, right? Now, what's changed really recently, and, and this is all, you know, this was kind of state of the art until, until very recently. Very recently, we've now begun to uh, basically get rid of all this whole physical modeling system with neural networks. So the idea of a physical model is you get an expert to kind of sit down and go, OK, this is how a string works physically. This is how you know, a bassoon works uh, physically. And that's really, really tedious, and it's expensive. And it's really hard to, to capture all of the complexity of those, of those um, physical phenomena. right? But with machine learning, you can actually do away with the whole expert uh, guidance and try to create an algorithm which just, just takes lots and lots of hours of recordings and then just figures out, basically, how uh, a model which will produce a sound, right? Now, um, most neural networks, which are used for, for all this machine learning, are kind of known for things like this, right? So image classification. You have um, a neural network which is composed of many, many mathematical operations, um, really simple ones, actually quite, quite homogenous. Uh, but at the input layer, it just takes in some media. So whether it's an image or a sound or some raw media. And then at the end, it produces a classification as this, um, as this image of a 9 does or this image of a 2, right? Um, and, and in the case of audio, uh, people are not as familiar with this. But of course, speech to text is a really, really important, um, uh, important thing that, that machine learning has to do. So whenever you're talking into your phone, hey, Siri, hey, Cortana, Hey, Alexa, can you find me this, this, and that? They actually have to decode the, the recording of your speech and turn that into natural language. And you can do that using ne neural networks. And actually, before they were state of the art for images, they were state of the art for audio. So this is from 2009, I think, when they first began to actually replace the kinds of models that we had built previous, previously. And, um, and so they've been around for audio, even though they're associated with images much more so, they've been around for audio um, arguably just as long. Now, what's, what's still kind of in the research pipelines is, is uh, neural networks not for classification or regression or really, really you know, mundane tasks like that, but actually neural nets as generative models. And a generative model is a neural network which actually, instead of telling you something about some piece of media, you know, like telling you, is this song 
uh, is this the is this recorded sound the word cat or dog right um, instead of doing something like that it can actually just all out produce audio or produce images or produce text and um, I won't go into the details of, of how how the, these work exactly, but I'll, I'll show you later at the end of my talk some resources that you can that you can look up to get into that more in depth. Uh, but basically, these are what are called autoencoders, and these are what are called generative adversarial networks. Um, these have been actually covered by like the the New York Times, and you know they've actually kind of broken into the mainstream, I guess. Um, generative adversarial networks are really really fascinating. I wish I, we had time to talk about exactly how they work, but I'm instead just going to show you some of the really cool things that they do, um, both with respect to images and audio. Um, be before getting into the audio, I want to show you some of the things they do with images. So a generative model can generate images that look like real life, maybe to some degree. I mean, a lot of these may not look exactly like real life to you, but they're state of the art compared to what we were able to do just a couple of years ago. So, and these are done entirely without any human guidance, right? They just digest millions of images and then they're able to spit out, you know, complete imaginary, you know, uh, imaginary samples from, from this data set. So here's like an art gallery and an auditorium. The ballroom is looking kind of weird, I suppose, but um, waiting room, butcher's shop. A food court, it's delicious, right? Um, and um, and I'm going to show you actually better better examples of this later. Um, but I want to first show you some of the some of this is from like 2015, 2016. Some of the first attempts to create generative models for audio um, using neural networks. And this was um, some work that I did with with a system called Groove that stands for Gated Recurrent Unit. I forget what V stands for. Uh, but basically, these were the first attempts at using uh, neural networks to produce audio. And I'm just going to show you like a few samples um, of, of some that I made using the software. So this, is, um, this took the album Blue Train by John Coltrane and then just you know, studied it for hours and hours and then attempted to, to uh, produce audio that sounds like it came from, a col from, from Blue Train, John Coltrane. Let's make sure the audio doesn't blow the speakers out. It's like really noisy, but you can kind of hear the faint like sound of a saxophone in the background, right? Um, and this is this is Chopin. Um, it's got that Chopin feel. This is the this is the culprit. That last thing tipped me off. I, I thought that was that was way too good, right? Like if you hear at the end, and it turns out that that actual line is directly memorized from from something on the album. So what it turns out is that these things were over what what's called overfitting. They were actually rather than generating new samples that sounded like they came from the original data, it cheated. It just kind of like memorized actual uh, recordings of Chopin and then sprinkled in a whole bunch of noise to, to try to disguise it, but then just, you know, try to pass it off as, as real. So it's not quite real. Um, so that was kind of the first attempt. Didn't go so well. I'll show you a few subsequent ones that went a lot better. Um, but I'll show you one cool artifact of that first. I, while I was using the software, I found a clip of a vibraphone. This is an actual vibraphone. It's very meditative, right? And so I just, I just, I thought it would be interesting. Like, what if you fed this one clip, this one really repetitive clip, to Groove and trained it for hours and hours to try to learn how to play it? And and this is what it sounds like coming out, uh, coming out the other side. And it just goes on like that. Uh, <laughs> so. That's kind of I like some of the artifacts, like the mistakes that come out of uh, out of early systems trying to generate audio. Um, now there was a big step forward taken um, about a year and a half ago by uh, DeepMind. So this is a group that is out in London that is owned by Google. They're most famous for AlphaGo. So if you've ever seen, you know, the big uproar over machines that can play the the, the game of Go, um, DeepMind created that. So they're quite well known, um, really on the forefront of like 
of artificial general intelligence. And they also created WaveNets. And WaveNets were, to this day, like still the best, um, the, the best system for producing audio that, um, for, as, for machine learning that exists online today. And actually, like just a few, maybe a month ago, Google announced that all of their uh, anything that generates voice in real time in production is using WaveNets now. So if you use uh, like Google Voice Assistant and things like that, it's all WaveNets. Um, and this is what they sound like. So this is an, an artificial voice generated by a WaveNet. The Blue Lagoon is a 1980 American romance and adventure film directed by Randall Kleiser. Aspects of the sublime in English poetry and painting, 1770 to 1850. So it's really, really smooth, and it's much better than the original systems that we use, which relied on like very expensive and kind of like incomplete physical models to model the human vocal cords, right? Um, now, uh, I want to I wanna show you, well, first I want to show you kind of a, a neat, funny thing about this, and then I'll talk about why it's, why it's so important, let's say. Um, they showed that you, know, you can make it say certain things if you condition the model on syllables, right? So you want it to say the, you ask it to say the. But you don't have to ask it to say anything. You can just make it just produce random sort of like stuff that sounds like kind of like human speech. But, but, but when you listen to it long enough, it doesn't make any sense at all. And, it, and this is how it sounds when you try to do that. So, it was to say chair. I'm still German, but I'm not German. I'm still 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 German. I'm there's a lot of work for cadence of determined buzz and A, because I have Jeff over here. It's hard to tell you to be the Sonata, though. That's a key old one. This must be what, what English sounds like to people who don't understand English, right? <laughs> I think. And I thought it'd be really funny to like run it through the YouTube closed captioning system. So you know how YouTube can do automatic closed captioning? So when the blog post came out, here I put the closed captioning on. So let's hear what, what, what YouTube thinks of it. Sudden. It was a toy chair. I was still German, but I didn't know what to do. I said, I'm not going to go to the school. I'm pretty. I'm. Class. I just ate it. There was this. There's a lot of work for cadence of your tongue. And there was an A because I had Jeff over it. I told you to be the son of a day. That came out on. Day. But to the same now, all spiritual. So I said, see the house, guys. Yeah, so Hello. you get the idea, um, and that's that's just kind of an aside. I like to I like to poke in a f some fun every once in a while, make sure no one's sleeping. So, <laughs> okay, so oh, I forgot to mention. So the the thing is, okay, so like you've heard, you know, your MacBook or whatever, like make speech years ago, right? So why is this so interesting? Well, the thing is that to f to make the computers make speech before, we had you know thousands of engineers basically spend thousands of hours creating a really sophisticated, expert, handcrafted algorithm which simulated the human vocal cords, right? Which means it's completely useless if you want to train it to understand other kinds of things. So for example, they showed how you can use the exact same system. It generalizes to other kinds of sound. So they fed it lots and lots of jazz music, right? Like I tried with the Ch Chopin model the year before. But they actually did it much more successfully. So they fed it lots and lots of piano music and asked it to synthesize piano jazz music, and this is how it came out sounding. So it's very suspenseful, and it never really resolves. And it's because these systems don't yet have like really good memory. You know, like they don't really they don't remember how to finish phrases and things like that. But it sounds like real life, right? And that, and it's the, the fact that it came entirely from an algorithm rather than some recording is um, is the first of its kind, at least for for the sake of machine learning. Um, and actually, like more recently, the group Magenta, also at Google, has been picking up on the WaveNet technology to try to make instruments for musicians. So this is the Nsynth project, where they basically use WaveNets to synthesize arbitrary combinations of different kinds of musical instruments or, or different kinds of sound-producing instruments. So they show, for example, like, what if you have a flute and an organ? What if you can take their WaveNets and kind of like mash them together and make something that sounds like a flute and an organ. 
and, the, and they actually turn these into MIDI instruments, so they, you can pick the pitch and the velocity and so on, and actually like incorporate these into, into your musical workflow. So it's kind of like an interesting hint of some of the future of, of you know, things like Reason, let's say, or like um, audio synthesizers, audio workstations. There will be a lot of this kind of uh, uh, more advanced functionality in, in your future digital audio workstation, I think. Um, now, uh, WaveNet is still kind of closed source, which is a real bummer. Uh, but there is, there have been like attempts to do it in in an open source. In open source, so this was actually an attempt to reverse engineer WaveNets inside of TensorFlow, is a project I participated on. And then I tried to record. I tried. This is my best attempt to make a WaveNet. This is utter failure. So I'm just, I'm just going to tell you. But it's kind of funny in a way. So I'd like to show it anyway. I tried to train in, uh, a WaveNet on Opera. On, on the Barber of Sevilla, so for anyone who's familiar with, with the Barber of Sevilla, and this is how that sounds. So t to me, it sounds like kind of like an orchestra, like when they're first tuning, kind of just, just making like a wall of sound. Uh, but you can hear, like, I heard like kind of tenor voices and, you know, little orchestral orchestral um, sounds in there. Um, but yeah, not, not so good, but, but this is kind of like, you know, progress, I guess. Um, this is like more of the same thing. So this is another system made by, uh, made by some pr uh, researchers in Montreal called Sample RNN. And this is them, their uh, versions of uh, Sample RNN learning how to play Mozart. Sounds like reasonably Mozart-ish, right? I guess, um, except for not having much memory. And then, how many people here know the band Tangerine Dream? Yeah. So this is Tangerine Dream. Yeah. Sounds like the real thing. Actually, I think. <laughs> yeah. You can make it do this forever. Like as long as you have electricity, you can just keep on going. <laughs> so um, I, I won't talk too much about these, but there's also been a lot of work in composing MIDI using machine learning, and that's really kind of like trying to bring in the songwriter. So it's not just about building the instruments, but about building the musicianship. And um, so these, there have been lots of really cool open source projects that uh, people have tried to, u to learn how to listen to um, or, or look at MIDI and then produce real MIDI or produce MIDI that looks, you know, convincing, li li as though con convincingly that it came from the original data set, right? Um, okay, so let me take a really quick di digression into the visual domain and show you some recent work that um, uh, doesn't seem related to the stuff that I just showed, but is actually going to be important when we talk about the idea of synthesizing um, media that has some objective um, to it. Um, so, first of all, you know, I mentioned didn't say much about how neural networks work, but um, I can tell you a few interesting things about neural networks um, in, spite of, in spite of that, which is that neural networks learn properties of media, right? So they learn what are the sort of salient features of images or of sounds, um, and, or, or what are like patterns that are found in large corpor corpuses of, of audio or, or images or video, things like that, right? And you can actually, there are techniques for uh, trying to understand that, to actually visualize what uh, neural networks will learn. So like for example, in this case, you're looking at the, the, each of these cells contains nine patches of real images. Uh, and, and these patches maximally activated that particular neuron inside the neural network. So this neural network, this neuron right here seems to like diagonal lines that are kind of look like this, right? And this, this cell right here, it has a neuron that likes patches of green. That's it, like really, really simple features. And, and this is what that looks like at a very early layer of the neural network, right? The neural networks are compositional. They kind of learn very simple features, and then on t they build from those simple features more complex features, like pattern detectors that are detecting patterns from the previous layer's patterns, if that makes any sense. Um, and so the patterns that it finds are increasingly complex. So again, these are from real images, right? And these, are, these cells show um, 
parts of real images that maximally excited that neuron. So this cell right here it has a neuron that likes circles, like concentric circles, right? And this cell right here likes uh, grids. I see like lattices or grids, fences, things like that. Um, this one likes upper bodies, you know, or maybe it likes you know torsos or heads or something like that. And you can see that they, uh, you know, it, it, and, and they're kind of resistant to superficial changes in in the color or the texture or the lighting conditions and things like that. And they're actually just looking for very meaningful sort of meaningful information, meaningful to us, right? Because because we train them. So um, you can uh, you can actually exploit this this um, this affinity that neural neural networks have for finding patterns to actually produce images. Right, so for example, let's say you find one neuron of interest in a neural network, and it looks and it it has it likes to look for something that looks kind of like apples. Right, you can actually synthesize an image which will which will maximally excite that neuron, and that's what this particular uh, one would look like. Right, so this right here, what I'm showing you, is the result of trying to synthesize an image from scratch, such that. It excites one particular neuron in a trained neural network, and that trained neural network has some filter that looks for. To me, these look like apples. I don't know if you have a better interpretation, but that's that's kind of mine. Um, and it turns out that you can do this technique for all of the neurons in the entire system. So this is what it looks like. There's 7,500 of them. I'm not going to show you all of them, of course, but I'll just show you a selection of the ones that I like. Um, and and this is. And you can see that, like in the early layers of the network, it finds really simple patterns, right? So you can kind of see these are just like straight lines, or you know grids. Uh, but the patterns become more and more complex as you move through the layers of the network, right? And you can go. Uh, I'm going sequentially through each of the layers. You'll see that that at some point the features begin to to correspond to like real life things. Like I see trees here, or uh, flowers, feathers. Um, these look like houses in, in some ways, or towers, right? <clears throat> Wheels, birds, snakeskin, um, cauliflower. I think that's kind of a cauliflower-looking thing. Um, so I've been exploring this technique recently. This is like some recent work of mine in the last few months, and and it's very closely related to to what's called deep dream. So may, maybe a lot of you are probably familiar with that. It's like a big project two years ago that that really. <clears throat> Um, kind of crossed crossed over from from machine learning academy into the mainstream. So this is like um, uh, that was a project from two years ago that, that I was also very interested in. But what this is doing is basically just synthesizing images which try to excite neural networks, right? And it's and you can you can um, there's all sorts of sort of degrees of freedom here, um, like how I arrange the masks that are that each of the channel each of the neurons are being you know kind of responsible for. Um, and this has been something that I've been doing the last few months. Like I actually had a couple workshops here about it, um, and I'll, I'll mention those later. But this is just some eye candy from that process. And you can also make um, videos, so you can use this in feedback systems. So this is something I put online just a few weeks ago, that basically uh, exploits this technique and then uses some other little generative art trickery to like make interesting-looking videos. And here, what I'm doing is I'm kind of warping, I'm distorting the canvas, and then using this like feedback technique where every image, every output image becomes the input to the next frame, to making the next frame, and um, and it just kind of goes on like this. Um, this is some stuff. Again, I'll, I'll give links for this a little bit later if you're interested in, in how how this stuff works. Um, now, um, getting getting back to how this is relevant to generative models. The the idea of generative models, right? And I showed I showed this a little earlier at the places data set. Um, the idea of generative models is we want to be able to create images which look real life, right? Like they look like they came from some data set. Uh, but we often have other constraints that we want. Oh, I was going to show that in a second. Yeah, we also have other constraints that that we want to impose in them. And actually, that'll be the next slide. Let me just show you. Like, yeah, this is kind of just the most realistic version of this that I found so far. This is from just just a few weeks ago, um, from some researchers at Nvidia synthesizing faces, and you can see that this is getting to be like really, really, yeah, like really real life uh, looking. 
um, and, and, and very high resolution, too. So the first time that we had generative models for working with images, you were limited to like 30 by 30 pixels. You know? So I would like um, generate fonts or you know, generate images of, of well, tiny faces, things like that. And now we're, we're able to synthesize uh, images that look like increasingly like real life. Like maybe if you stare at these hard enough, they won't appear very human to you sometimes, but uh, other times they're like actually quite convincing. Um, and what's cool is that you can interpolate between them. And, that's, and the, that's a result of having found these, as I mentioned, these patterns, these sort of like high-level feature detectors um, that detect meaningful patterns, meaningful to us, right? So like, for example, the amount of beard someone has, that might be one of the, that might be, one neuron might be responsible for that, amount of beard neuron, let's say. <laughs> Um, as a joke, I, I ran a celebrity face detector over this and put this online a few weeks ago. So like, I tried to find if any of those, there's a one hour long video that, that, that NVIDIA released of these imaginary, they were trained on imaginary uh, and trained on celebrities. And so I thought like maybe, um, maybe you could try to find if any of them looked like actual celebrities. So this is like generative Renee Zellweger and generative Chris Rock. Uh, this is something that I had fun with a few weeks ago. Um, and um, so, yeah, li like, let me just really quickly mention generative models for other kinds of media. <clears throat> so you can generate natural language. So this is an, a neural network that basically looks at an image and then writes a little story about that image. So it's using uh, actually two neural networks together. And I'll just read like a selection of this really quickly. So it looks at this image and it goes, we were barely able to catch the breeze at the beach, and it felt as if someone stepped out of my mind. She was in love with him for the first time in months, so she had no intention of escaping. The sun had risen from the ocean, making her feel more alive than normal. It was trained on romance novels, which is why it sounds like that. It's like, or like really, um, well, yeah, so, but that's, that's pretty neat, right? That you can actually uh, have text which is used to describe an image, like a neural network uh, describes an image in natural language, right? And you can actually do it in reverse, too. So you can have, so before we had an, um, you know, text describing an image, and here you have an image describing text. So the neural network receives a line of text, like this bird is white, black, and brown in color with a brown beak. And then um, you can produce an image which matches that caption that you, that you gave it. So this, these are all generated images which try to conform to the sentence that you trained it on. And all this stuff is like still in its very early days. Um, but, but again, like, you know, compared to maybe two years ago is kind of unbelievable uh, where, where we've gotten to. Um, and it has its own latent space that you could play with, so it's a lot of interesting stuff. Uh, point cloud generation, so this is like generating 3D models. I get asked about these a lot in, in classes where we deal mostly with images. Um, and, uh, and this has also like, been lagging behind, but now we're, we have generative models for producing three-dimensional shapes and meshes and voxels and things like that. Um, another, uh, another cool uh, application of generative models is transforming images, so like an image filter, for example. So for, let, what if you had like, a magic filter that took a satellite image and turned it into a map automatically, right? Or you had a picture of something in the daytime, and you had a magic filter that gave you the corresponding picture at night, right? Or uh, it can take semantic map, maps or labels, right? And turn those into textures. So like imagine you're an architect and you're trying to mock up building designs, right? And all you have to do is create the label map, and then you're automatically given this texture which conforms to the to the you know asset that you created. So th this is all these are all you know imagine imagine like to be very useful assistant tools to a composer or to an architect or you know an artist, anyone trying to be creative with these tools. And that's something that we've been kind of working on over the last year and a half, or two years. And I'll just show you some work that I've done with this system very quickly. This was made, this is a project called Invisible Cities, a collaborative project with some, some students of mine, um, actually from the week that this um, software came out. And what we did was we downloaded a whole bunch of map uh, tiles from Mapbox. Mapbox is a service that lets you create your own maps. And then we downloaded satellite imagery. So this was actually in Milan. This is a year, a year ago, a year and a half ago. And uh, here you have map tiles. 
and satellite imagery from Milan. And what we do is you train one of these, it's called Pix to Pix. You train the Pix to Pix generative model to take one of these map, map tiles and convert it into satellite imagery. And, you, and we did this for multiple cities, so like Milan, Venice, um, uh, Los Angeles, and others, right? And the idea here is that you take the map tile from one city <clears throat> and feed it through the generative model for another city. So you take the map tiles from Milan and, gener and generate satellite imagery from Los Angeles. So you get sort of Milan in the style of Los Angeles or Milan in the style of Venice. And it's cool with the Venice model, what we notice is that the roads become canals, which is kind of like a neat, neat little learned feature. And something very closely related to this is, um, and this is in, in some research cycles, circles, cycles, <laughs> um, something called CycleGAN, which is very similar to Pix2Pix, except it doesn't require that the images, the, your training set, be paired. So you don't need exact pairs of images. You can actually do it in a way that doesn't involve pairing the images. So let's say you wanted to turn a zebra into a horse. Right? So like you, you can get a, a, th an Im a thousand pictures of zebras and a thousand pictures of horses and train a generative model to convert the horse into a zebra. Right? And they showed this video of them uh, turning a horse into a zebra in real time. This is, this is about, I think, half a year ago, roughly. And this one's super viral. Um, it's pretty, pretty awesome. Notice that the like, green uh, pasture becomes kind of brown. So it's kind of because zebras are usually in savannas, let's say, like they're a little more brown. So it actually can like gets a little bit of the of the sort of contextual bias in there. Um, but and also the the uh, a funnier thing is notice the zebra turns the pole striped. Like whenever the zebra gets really close to a pole, it becomes striped. That's because it's like hard for the network to, to discern like where the zebra ends and the rest of the world begins, and that causes it to make some really funny mistakes sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so for my own, for my own, um, invo this this was an idea that I that I borrowed from uh, Mario Klingerman, who's a really excellent uh, like neural artist. And here, what I did was basically I collected a whole bunch of images of he who cannot be named um, from the State of the Union address last year, and um, basically uh, extracted his like face landmarks, right? So I think I can, oh, um, I can't remember if I can find, is it this? Yeah, so extract these, right? Extract these from him using a face tracker, and then train, a gener train picks to picks to convert one of these into one of these. And then I can put myself in front of the camera, extract my own face features, and then take that and then turn it into one of these, right? So this is kind of my own personal meat puppet. And you can run this in real time. I've run this at workshops, and it really usually frightens everybody for obvious reasons. Um, yeah, it's just horrifying, isn't it? And, and actually, like, if you think this is, you know, this looks kind of like a joke, right? But, but actually, oh, I should mention, a student of mine did this for Angela Merkel. So same, same kind of. Same idea. So you have an Angela Merkel puppet. Um, now, um, uh, bef before I talk about the significance of that, I want to complete the uh, kind of uh, complete the thought about you know impersonating people. So this you you can't. You, it's not just that you can generate people's faces convincingly. You can also generate their their voices convincingly as well. So here. Um, this is a service called Lyrebird. This is a really new company that claims that they can uh, replicate people's, people's voices. So this is um, them showing that they've stolen the voice of, of, of Trump, Obama, and Hillary hey, Clinton. Have you heard about this new technology? Are you speaking about this new algorithm to copy voices? Yes, it is developed by a startup called Lyrebird. This is huge. They can make us say anything now, really anything. The good news is that they will offer the technology to anyone. This is huge. How does their technology work? You guys get the idea, right? So, and they have an online demo that you can actually train your own voice on. So, this is what I sound like. I'm very excited to participate in this year's Loop Festival in Berlin. My talk is called Deep Listener Machine <laughs> Learning in the Composer's Future Toolkit. Later, we will have a machine learning for artists workshop. So, I, I mean, it doesn't capture a lot of the sort of like, you know, intonation, things like that, but it captures the voice like actually pretty convincingly. So, and that was from just five minutes of recordings. 
Right, so, we do uh, one Christmas so trip. So this is, again, like uh, the completing the trifecta. small business Saturday. I usually go out there with the girls. This is completely synthetic. And the last couple of years, we've gone to bookstores. Okay. Because the nice thing about a bookstore is you can cover a lot of ground. You can get books for, you know, the... So, uh, and I, I'm running out of time, so I want to be really quick about this, but like, this is kind of, imagine in the future that you can basically, and Moritz mentioned this with a deep fake, right? This is related. You'll be able to convincingly generate anyone's visage, anyone's sort of like appearance, anyone's voice, and you know, how does that sort of, you know, what, what, what are the security implications of that, for example, um, of all things to, to worry about? Um, now, um, I want to really quickly, I'm going to, how much time do I have? Like five minutes or longer? F five? Okay. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip this. This is, doesn't actually sound that good. I want to get to, um, this, is, this is kind of the last segment, and this is going to complete the, the depressing uh, part of this, because, this <laughs> you know, we talked about, we've already talked about production and songwriting. Now we're going to talk about curation. This is my favorite part. So I'm going to show you some, some work by uh, a researcher at DeepMind named Sander Dilliman, who's worked in um, content-based music recommendation. So if you've ever used music recommend, almost all of us have seen music recommendation services. Um, on Spotify, on Last.fm, things like that, Amazon. And almost all of them work using what's called collaborative filtering, where they analyze uh, purchasing patterns by many, many users. And if there's some artist that you're not familiar with that other people who have a similar listening profile to you uh, p uh, tend to like, then that will be recommended to you, because there's a good chance that you'll probably also like it, right? Now, the downside of that is that there's no, um, there's <clears throat> there's no, nothing about the content inside the, you know, the, there's nothing about the audio that's inside that decision. And that's problematic because that means that new music never gets recommended, right? Because, you know, if something hasn't been purchased by anybody, how will it ever be recommended to somebody, right? And, and, and so it's missing a lot of what we might like in the music recommendation system. So Sander Dilliman worked um, for a little while with Spotify on trying to create content-based music recommendation systems. So something that will analyze the audio and then predict how much you'll like it. And I'm going to describe it at a very high level, like very quickly. Uh, but the idea is to project both users, well, first to project music, like songs, into, uh, uh, into sort of what's called like a latent factor space, right? It's like kind of this, um, an embedding of each song into uh, some, let's say, 100-dimensional space where each of the dimensions corresponds to some perceptually meaningful feature of that audio, right? And the idea is that two songs that are very close in this space are similar to each other and are likely to be liked by the same person, right? And if they're far apart, they're dissimilar. And then the idea is you want to project the users, the listening profiles, into that same space so that a user, you know, if they're close to some music, it should be a good recommendation, right? And, um, and, the, you, and, then, and then once you have that, you try to learn a regression model, which will take any piece of audio and then project it into this latent factor, latent factor space. I know that's like a really, really like abstract description, but just kind of go with it. There's, there's a lot more that, that can be said, but, but basically it works this way. Um, and, and if you have that, you can automatically take any piece of audio and project it into that space, right? Um, and, and it gives you, and you know, this is some results that they gave, like, okay, for Daft Punk, in, in most systems, like, uh, you know, co collaborative filtering systems, a Daft Punk song will just give you more Daft Punk recommendations, right? Which is not particularly interesting. And this is actually able to find, predict uh, songs from, from uh, artists who are much less well-known, but may have similar audio um, content to, to Daft Punk. And let me skip that. And now, now the cool thing about this is now why I mentioned the whole uh, Deep Dream stuff when I showed you the, the you know, interesting sort of visuals from that. The uh, idea is that you can do something very similar with audio. Once you have this regression model that, that projects audio into some latent space, you can try to analyze the neurons inside of that neural network and try to figure out what, what patterns that they are looking for. And this is actually some stuff, um, that, and I'm, I'm going to have to skip that, that part, but basically like each of these bands might be capturing some interesting aspect of, 
of the music. Like maybe, maybe there's a bunch of songs where the vocals are, are harmonizing in, in major thirds or something like that. You know, and maybe that's actually important for figuring, you know, because maybe some people really, really like that. And so it turns out that there's going to be a neuron that can actually find that. And then therefore you can detect, you can actually measure if a song um, has that particular property. Um, and, and, and if you, so, well, that property among many others, right? So like if the music has um, vocals or if it doesn't have vocals, lots of, lots of things along that, those lines. So this is now this is the final sort of like the trifecta. Imagine you combine this content-based recommendation system with WaveNets. So WaveNet, so you use a WaveNet to generate audio, not that not so that it sounds similar to some data set of audio that you already have, but rather you generate audio so that it achieves a particular embedding in this latent space, like the embedding of a user's taste profile. So like maybe you'll be able to grab someone, a user's listening taste profile and generate audio from them that matches their, their taste profile, right? So like what is, this, what is the iPod of the future, right? Like and, and maybe, maybe you well, one day in 2045 or something like that, you pick up your iPod and maybe it knows how you're feeling at that moment and it knows what other kinds of music that you listen to and it, it takes all that information and it's able to generate audio on the spot for you f at that exact moment for however you're feeling without any musicians in the loop. So that's like, you know, what does is, what is the future musician do in that case? I'm not really sure. It's like obviously like a very dystopian scenario. And, and I just want to reassure all of you that, that we're nowhere near uh, like anything like this happening. But it's worth asking now, like if, if this technology actually comes to fruition, what does that mean about musicians? Like what is it, ch does it change the role of a musician? Do musicians, uh, you know, what, what, what is the future of a musician if you, if you can, if algorithms can generate all the music that we, that we need and can do so in a way that's more compelling than any humans can, right? Um, okay, well, I guess I'm out of time, so I'll just mention mlfreda.github.io. This is a website that you can learn about machine learning for artists if you're so interested in it. Um, and it's where I compile most of my notes and lectures and classes. And I have some slides to show, but I, I think I'm out of time. So I'm going to just leave it at that. And we can you know, open up for questions, things like that. So thank you. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you, Gene, for filling in the remaining spots that Moritz left where we were able to escape and not <laughs> have it be the end of music. Now it's definitely the end of music. So questions from the, questions, questions from the crowd. Yes, in the back. Yes. OK, uh, man, you just made a mess of my mind here. But um, so basically, three things that come to my mind. First of all, we can come to a solution that would technically uh, generate a music that's aimed for a hit or aimed for, for getting to that position or where there's many other tracks that have a certain style, style or whatever. So this could be like the ultimate uh, uh, read factory machine that you can produce hits and more or less like other people already tried to do in the past. Second thing is that you could have companies doing music like for instance if I have Spotify I could generate the content like they are already doing putting in Spotify, making the royalty of it, and then it's really the end of the chain because no artist, no anything, and, and, and it's... So, um, is this can be possible somehow? Do you think that... Um, analyzing from the artist's point of view, you know, like... Um, can we allow to do that? Like, if, is there not like... A, like when Napster come, when all this, the, 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 this boom of like downloading music came that everybody started to collide with like uh, many bands started to go against it like Metallica. Is there people already talking about this? Like is there a lot of uh, controversial generating on the community? How is this coming from the artist's point of view? You know, all these this perspectives that you're showing. Am so I clear or wait, not? Is the, is the, is the, the question is how are, how are artists responding to this? Yes, exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Sort of dystopia. Yes, yes, yes. Is there any people talking about this? Because probably it's really fresh. No, 
not much space <coughs> to, to dialogue I, yet. Uh, there's not been a lot of discussion yet, and I think part of it is there's a lot of disbelief that anything like this is possible. And, and actually, it's not uh, obvious that it is possible to, like, like what I just showed, the dystopian nightmare. Um, it's not necessarily that we'll ever get there, but that in principle we can see a set of building blocks that if they were sufficiently improved, that they could do this. And I think for the most part, like mo th mostly there's resistance because people will say, well, it's not really music, or you know, if a human didn't make it, it's not actually music, I won't listen to it. And, um, but I, don't, uh, I, I guess I would say is that, yeah, mostly there's just disbelief. Well, I guess that I guess maybe that's would be my next question. How is sort of how knowable the endpoints of these things are from a sort of mathematical standpoint or, or a computer standpoint? I know that the the people involved in the first ever nuclear test were afraid that because one of their theories was if they set this thing off, that they might ignite the entire atmosphere. <laughs> Right. And sort of set the whole Earth's atmosphere on fire. And yeah. so they did, there were some things that they didn't really know. There were things they knew about what they had discovered and where they were going. And there were things where they really had kind of no idea. Now, in retrospect, that's sort of a laughable um, theory. Yeah. How, how, how knowable at this point is this sort of endpoint? I mean, we see this kind of a, uh, very impressive image examples. Um, is, is how inevitable but does this seem? Or is that kind of calculable to any degree? It, it's really, a, a, anyone who has a very definite answer to those questions is, is, is probably selling you something. Because, because it's actually, even for really, really talented researchers, the questions uh, you know, depend on a lot more than our knowledge. They depend on a lot of unknown factors like uh, bo both scientific factors and also like socio-political factors, you know, whether or not these things ever get the support that's ne that they require in order to become improved, e even if they theoretically can. Um, it's really hard to tell. I think like it's, there's a ton of momentum right now behind all these techniques and a ton of money, that's for sure. So lots of people working on it. So it definitely seems to be very much likely that these things will improve substantially. Whether or not they ever, you know, approach approach, you know, this this scenario, is like maybe like very far, you know, maybe like a few decades from now. I think it's very possible, though, um, at least from a like scientific mathematical perspective. Uh, yeah, very much possible. Hello. Who has the mic? Yeah. Oh. On. Yes. Um, I just got a point of view, maybe you can criticize or see it. Seeing the um, mechanization, the automatization of production in music and the consumption of what most people consume in arts, musical, maybe um, probably the music and the, the artist as a producer can have a much, much more value as, um, like example, a musicologist trying to use a music as a therapy for helping people that as a product to consume. You know? mm -hmm. uh, maybe in my view or my vision, maybe a musicologist in the future will earn more money than a musician. Yeah, yeah. I, because I, the automatization is making everything, okay, I have the product, I go consume it, okay, ready. And uh, we have in the actual, actual times more psychological, technological, social dystopias with mm -hmm. ourselves also, no? crashing with the social networks and so much information and the easy of consuming, no? That is all, everything like, okay, I pay, I consume, I go, I, and the automatization, no? This is just a point of view. Yeah, no, this is, this is actually a really good example. And, and, and actually, the first job that I had, I showed way back in the beginning of the talk, was working for people who wanted to do exactly that. They wanted to not actually produce music for, a particu for therapy, but, but playlists, produce playlists for a particular therapeutic use case. 
And um, yeah, I, I would say that like that is to me like a really like a, a good exa an example of a, of a possibly very beneficial use case. You know, like instead of producing pop music for everyone, maybe you can actually try to produce music that has some therapeutic properties. And so I can imagine that being like very much you know one of the one of the good things that we could do with it. Yeah, I I'd love to see that like kind of pursued in the future. Th th just to understand the benefit of this approach to that would be that that you could train it on somebody's uh, own preferences or um yeah, yeah maybe um, preferences but also um, but also like like for example if you're trying to produce calming music you can actually measure to some there is you know some basis for measuring how calm somebody is so perhaps you can actually determine causally what kind of music causes someone to calm down um, or to feel or, or to, you know, like, uh, like music as an antidepressant even. Like can, can music elevate people's moods? You can potentially actually learn, um, you know, like on a machine learning based and also like physiological basis if, that, if there's actually a way to do that. Um, so yeah, I would say that would be a really cool use case. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tons of it, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'm not, I don't, I can't think of something offhand, but I have lists, like, uh, if you, if you, I can, I can show later, yeah. Like, I, there's been, maybe, maybe not necessarily for, for synthesis of music, but, but actually just like um, playlisting, which is related. I mean, it's trying to, it's trying to capture what aspects of already existing recorded music can be used for therapeutic purposes, but yeah, lots of, there's lots of interest in that. Mm -hmm. Hi. Over there, I think. Yeah? Yep. Go ahead. Um, hi, thanks for a fascinating um, talk. Yeah, it is deeply concerning in some aspects, less so about the, the kind of quality of the cultural production because it looks, yeah, um, shocking at present. Uh, but um, one of my concerns is that the, the way that um, cultural products are analyzed and interpreted is, is quite reductivist in, in this mode of producing algorithmic-based technologies because everything is seen as an equivalence. Everything is seen as a data point. So you're able to write a bit of software uh, and an algorithmic process that can read a map of Venice and interpret it as an image in the same way that it would interpret something that is um, a piece of music or a, a facade of a building, um, which that mode of thinking itself has deeply reductivist manners of then reproducing culture itself. There are, there, it, it's utterly acontextual. It doesn't locate how we make things in the broader systems of interconnection. Um, are there any possibilities for uh, these types of softwares to step beyond that reductivist mode of working and start to think more interconnectedly, I suppose? So, so to... to can, can, can you say the question part of that again? Or? Yeah, how, how would you... How would you start to think about how you look at culture in a way that doesn't reduce it primarily to data points, which is what it seems that algorithmic software does. It assumes everything's the same. The technology doesn't care whether it's a painting or it's a piece of architecture. You know, a city is massively different in its experiences and its conditions to the Mona Lisa. Yet, a way that a piece of software intrinsically understands the world in the way that we've built these things is seeing these as commonalities because it's it's just the same, isn't it? It's all the same stuff. That, to my way of thinking, reduces things and, and eliminates contextual understanding. That potentially goes right back to the way that computing is found and understood, but it seems a really big challenge that if we wish to use these things to understand our world, we have to find a way of incorporating the interconnectedness of things into that software. Is that achievable in these modes of working? Um, well, I don't know if... It yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if most people would say necessarily that, you know, we, that, the, that uh, these data points capture everything that there is to know about a particular object. Um, I mean, there's a lot of recognition that, like, our data, uh, data capturing systems are incomplete or insufficient. And so most of these systems are sort of, like, doing the best we can. I don't know if there's, you know, like, there's, you know, the, the statement that these are... Like, I, I don't think anyone's made that ambitious of a statement that these are, you know, that capture fully all of the essence of all of these things. Um, it's just kind of like the state of the art right now. Yeah. I mean, um, of course, like, there, there's always, there's, a there's an understanding that, that they're never going to be perfect. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, this is the, it seems like this is the f sort of philosophical question of whether the map of the thing is the thing. So what we just saw were um, algorithms for image processing and audio processing and some text processing. Mm -hmm. You can apply some of the same algorithms that you use to process an image to digital data of sound. That doesn't necessarily mean that, any, that an image is a person, you know. Um, so we may, we may be getting over ambitious a little bit with that, with that question. Uh, this is something that the hack lab will also have to answer over the course of the week with however they frame their, their performances, you know. If they're working with this uh, technique that involves uh, sound processing, what, what will the larger cultural context of the performance be that they build around that? You know, I don't, I don't know. But there are certain assumptions that are built into, I think, the way that we're increasingly seeing the software develop that, that is potentially, potentially reductive. You know, if we see that that um, is trained on certain kind of extremely mainstream types of culture, then that gets reproduced and rebuilt into that software mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It is a, yeah. Well, it's definitely reductive. It's not potentially reductive. It's reductive by design. That's, yeah. it yeah. has to be, yeah. And, and yeah, like, um, so, so yeah, they, they, of course, like all of these systems, they're, they're, they're totally de deterministic. Um, and so whatever, you know, whatever the aspects of the, whatever characteristics of the data are, you know, in the data before it goes into these networks, that's what they learn. Like that's, so, you know, so yes, like by definition. Um, I'm going to propose actually that because of time that we take mm -hmm. a break, um, which is not to say don't ask those questions, but let's ask them over a coffee or depending on how you feel after those presentations over mm -hmm. scotch. Um, <laughs> we will be back at four with kind of two different takes on this. So if this, <laughs> these are sort of speculative, somewhat terrifying maybe, but speculative futures that can come out of this. The two presentations afterwards suggest artistic response. So uh, both of our two speakers in the afternoon are um, not just talking about what might be, but talking about ways artists now are already using these tools, subverting these tools, and creating alternative scenarios for where they might go. Which is to say, it might cheer you up if you feel, if you feel, if you feel bleak. And uh, either way, let's all go have a coffee. Thanks so much.